Let's pray. Once again, Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us with your presence. Thank you for your word. We live in a world where everything seems to be spinning out of control. But we thank you that we can build upon the solid rock of your holy word to know what has happened, what is happening, and what soon will take place on this earth. We ask for your guidance as we open your holy book today. Send your Holy Spirit through the ministration of the angels to make things clear to our minds and to open our hearts. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Israel had just crossed the Red Sea. And they had sung the song of Moses in Exodus chapter 15. And then they arrived in the desert to a place where God wanted to test their willingness to obey His holy law. Go with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 16 and verse 4, and let's take a look at what that test was. Exodus 16 and verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day. Why were they to do this? Notice, that I may test them, is this a test for Israel? Yes, that I may test them whether they will what? Walk in my law or not. In other words, the purpose of this test is to see if Israel is willing to obey what? God's holy law. It is a test. And so the Bible tells us that God rained what is known as manna from heaven. Now the word manna simply means what is it? Because when the manna fell to the earth, the Israelites came out, they'd never seen this before, and so they started saying manna, manna. In other words, what is it? What is it? And it was actually bread that God had rained from heaven. Now God told the Israelites to go out and gather the manna six days a week. Every day they were supposed to gather manna except for the Sabbath. We start to catch a glimpse of the fact that God is testing them regarding what? Regarding the observance of the seventh day Sabbath. This is before God gave the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. God is testing their willingness to keep his holy Sabbath. And the Bible tells us that some of the Israelites went out to pick up men on the Sabbath and they found none. And notice Exodus 16 and verse 28, what uh, the words that we find where God is speaking to the Israelites that have gone out to look for manna and they have found none. Here God says, How long do you refuse to keep my what? my commandments, and my laws. Interesting, God had not yet revealed His commandments or His laws. That comes in Exodus 20. So it must be that the Sabbath existed before God gave it at Mount Sinai. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Because God says, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? And this particular commandment had to do with not picking up manna when? On the Sabbath. It was a command, in other words, to observe God's holy Sabbath. Now it becomes obvious that God wanted to teach a profound lesson through the manna. And we know this because after God gave manna to Israel, He commanded the Israelites to take some of the manna and put it in a golden pot and place it inside the Ark of the Covenant. This must have been very, very important because there are only three things that were in the Ark of the Covenant we're going to notice. There was, first of all, the tables of the law, the Ten Commandments. Secondly, Aaron's rod that budded. And in the third place, a golden pot of manna. Let's read about that pot of manna. Exodus 16 and verses 32 through 34. Then Moses said, 
This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Fill an omer with it. An omer is about a half a gallon. Fill an omer with it to be kept for your generations that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer of manna in it and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before what? Remember what the testimony is? The tables of the testimony. We talked about that uh, last evening. So Aaron laid it up before the testimony. Now I want to read a passage from Hebrews chapter 9 where it clearly tells us that the pot of manna and Aaron's rod and the Ten Commandments were inside the Ark of the Covenant. Notice Hebrews chapter 9 and we'll read verses 1 through 5. It says there, Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. Which, which apartment is that? That is the holy place. And then it continues saying in verse 3, And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, actually a better translation is the holy of holies, had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold. And now notice what was in the ark of the covenant. It says, In which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. So question, was the manna in the Ark of the Covenant? Yes, it was. Was Aaron's rod in the Ark of the Covenant? Yes, we'll talk about Aaron's rod later on in this series. The Ten Commandments, of course, were found inside the Ark of the Covenant. But now we have a little problem. It just so happens that uh, Hebrews is describing the tabernacle that was built in the desert. But what about Solomon's temple? Was the pot of manna and was the Aaron's rod in the temple that Solomon built? This is where we have a problem. Go with me to 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 9. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 9. It's speaking here about the Ark of the Covenant, and notice a very interesting detail. It says there, Nothing was in the Ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses put there at Horeb, when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. So in the temple built by Solomon, what was the only thing that was found inside the Ark of the Covenant? Only, it says here, the what? The tablets of stone which Moses put there at Horeb. So immediately the question comes, what happened to the pot of manna and what happened to Aaron's rod in between the time of the wilderness tabernacle and the time of the temple that was built by Solomon? Is it just perhaps the case that maybe one of them is wrong? Maybe simply the book of Hebrews is wrong when it says that the manna and uh, Aaron's rod was in the uh, Ark of the Covenant and then later, you know, in 1 Kings it says that it wasn't in the Ark of the Covenant, that, that there's this discrepancy or contradiction in the Bible? No. We don't accept the idea that there are contradictions in the Bible. And so the question is, how do you reconcile what was in the Ark in the tabernacle in the wilderness, and what was in the ark that, uh, of, of, the, of the temple that Solomon built. I want to present a quotation from Ellen White, because she resolves this apparent problem. Notice early writings, page 32. This is very, very interesting, and there's Bible backing for what she says. I'm going to provide that in a few moments. God took her in vision to the heavenly temple in the holy city of the New Jerusalem. And notice what she says. In the holiest, I saw an ark. 
On the top and sides of it was purest gold. On each end of the ark was a lovely cherub with its wings spread out over it. Their faces were turned toward each other and they looked downward. Between the angels was a golden censer. Above the ark where the angels stood was an exceeding bright glory that appeared like a throne where God dwelt. That's the Shekinah by the way. Then she says, Jesus stood by the ark and as the saints prayers came up to him the incense in the censer would smoke and he would offer up their prayers with the smoke of the incense to his father. And then here comes the portion of the quotation which is very interesting. She says, in the ark was the golden pot of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the tables of stone which folded together like a book. What happened with the pot of manna and Aaron's rod that budded? It was what? It was transported to the heavenly sanctuary because you can only have one Aaron's rod that budded. <laughs> Because if you have in heaven one that is not Aaron's rod that budded, then it's not going to be Aaron's rod, right? It was Aaron's rod that budded. Interestingly enough, the book of Revelation strongly hints that the manna is in heaven because in Revelation 2 verse 17, we're told that when Jesus comes, he will take us to heaven and he will feed us with the hidden manna. And where is the manna hidden? It is hidden in the Ark of the Covenant. So the pot of manna is in heaven, and Aaron's rod that budded is in heaven now, somewhere in between the tabernacle in the wilderness and the temple built by Solomon, these things were placed in the heavenly sanctuary. But now we need to ask the question, what lesson did God want to teach through the manna? What vitally important lesson would make it so significant that the manna would be placed inside the Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments. Let's examine this by going to the Gospel of John, chapter 5 and verse 39, and we'll read verse 40, and then we'll jump down to verses 45 through 46. John 5, 39 and 40, and 45 and 46. Here Jesus is speaking to a group of Jews, and notice what he says. You search the scriptures. Which scriptures was he referring to? It had to be the Old Testament scriptures, because at this point, when Jesus is on earth, the New Testament has not been written yet. So it's the Old Testament scriptures. You search the scriptures, Jesus says, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of whom? Of me, Jesus says. So the question is, to whom do the writings of Moses point? To whom do the scriptures point? They point to Jesus. Now, let's go to verse 40. Jesus says, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. You go to the scriptures because you want eternal life, you think there's eternal life in them, and yet you don't want to come to me. Those scriptures point to me that you might have eternal life. Then notice verse 45. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. And now comes the key portion of the verse. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. About whom did Moses, Moses write? He wrote about Jesus. To whom do the scriptures give testimony? They give testimony to Jesus. In other words, the writings of Moses are centered in Jesus Christ. Now we want to study one particular verse, and we're going to study other verses in relationship to it, to it, but there's one particular verse that I want us to take a look at. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. One verse from the writings of Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. Here God is speaking about when he gave the manna and the reason why he gave the manna. Remember the manna lesson is significant. It's a test for Israel to see whether they were going to keep God's Sabbath or not. 
And it was so important that God placed a pot of manna in the Ark of the Covenant. It, and it's in heaven right now. It must be tremendously significant. Now notice Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3. So he humbled you. Moses is describing this episode of Israel's history. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. Now why did God give the manna? You know, most of the time I ask that question, people say, well, because the people were in the desert and they needed food to eat. But that's not the main reason why God gave the manna. Notice the reason that is clearly expressed here. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that, here comes the reason, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. What did the manna represent? The manna represented the word of God. Because he said, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In other words, the manna represented God's word. The Bible makes it clear that the manna was more than physical food. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and let's read verses 1 to 4, where the Apostle Paul is reminiscing about some of the experiences of Israel's history. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verses 1 to 4. The manna was not primarily physical food, although it did provide physical nourishment. But that's not the main reason why God gave the manna. He gave it to show Israel that man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now let's notice 1 Corinthians 10 verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and now listen up, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, that's the water that came from the rock, and notice, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Was the manna symbolic? Did it have a spiritual lesson? Yes. Was the water that came from the rock symbolic? Did it represent something beyond literal H2O? Absolutely. Was the literal rock a symbol of the much more profound spiritual truth? Absolutely. So we know that the manna represents the Word of God and its spiritual food. But the question is, who is the Word of God? Go with me to John chapter 1, verse 1. And then we'll go down to verse 14. John chapter 1, verse 1, and then we'll go down to verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it says in verse 14, the first part of the verse, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who is the Word? The Word is Jesus Christ. So what did the manna represent? The manna represented Jesus. Let me prove it to you with a clear text from the Gospel of John. John 6, verses 48 through 50. John 6, 48 through 50. Spiritually speaking, the manna represented Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the Word of God. He's the speech of God the Father. He reveals God the Father. He teaches what the God the Father told him to say. Notice John 6, 48 through 50. Here Jesus is speaking, and he says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. So what did the manna represent? The manna represented the word of God, and the word of God is whom? The Word of God is Jesus. But let's become a little bit more specific. Not only did the manna represent Jesus generally, but there was something specific about Jesus that was represented by the manna, some S aspect of Jesus that was represented by the manna. Let's go to John 6, verse 51, the very next verse. Jesus says here, 
I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And now listen carefully. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh which I shall give for the life of the world. What does the manna specifically represent about Jesus? It represents his what? It represents his flesh. Did you catch that point? So, the manna represents the word of God. The word of God represents Jesus. But specifically, what does the manna represent concerning Jesus? It represents his what? His flesh. Don't forget that. That's key for everything that we're going to study. The manna represented his flesh. Now let's go to Exodus 16 and verses 19 and 20. See, we have to go back to the Old Testament to the manna episode because Jesus is speaking about the manna. So what better place to discover what he wants to teach than by going back to the manna episode in the Old Testament. Notice Exodus 16 verses 19 and 20. How many days was the manna supposed to be picked up? It was supposed to be picked up six days, which was the only day in which the manna was not to be picked up. It was not to be picked up on the Sabbath. Now what happened if somebody picked up manna on Wednesday and saved it for Thursday? Or any other day other than the Sabbath? Let's read about it. Exodus 16, 19 and 20. And Moses said, Let no one leave any of it till morning. Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses. In other words, they didn't pay any attention to Moses. But some of them left part of it until morning. And now two things happened with the manna, which represents what? The flesh of Jesus. Don't forget that. Two things happened with the manna that was picked up on not Friday for Sabbath, but some other day, which is not identified here. And so it says, it bred what? It bred worms and stank. Was this ordinary bread? If you go to the grocery store and you buy a loaf of bread and you don't open it today, you open it tomorrow, when you open the package tomorrow it has worms, right? And stinks. No. Well, let's suppose that you leave it in the package for a week and you don't open the package till a week from, from now. When you open the package, it's, whoo, this stinks and it's full of worms. No. Absolutely not. Let me ask you, what is it that breeds worms and stinks? It is dead what? Dead decomposing flesh. Am I right? Absolutely. But now notice what happened when the manna was picked up on Friday for Sabbath. Exodus 16 and verses 23 and 24. And what does the manna represent? The flesh of Jesus, very well. Exodus 16, 23 and 24. Then he said to them, This is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Notice, not the Sabbath of the Jews, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today, that is on Friday, and boil what you will boil, and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. So they laid it up till morning, as Moses commanded. And now notice very interesting, it says, And it did not what? It did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. You know, I did a word search of the word stink. You remember the story of Lazarus? You know, when Jesus said, take away the stone, what did the people say? Lord, he stinketh to use good old King James language. He stinketh, Lord. It's a corpse that stinks, right? And it's a corpse that breeds worms. And so when the manna was picked up on Friday, and saved for the Sabbath, it was as fresh on Sabbath as it had been on Friday. Now what was God trying to teach? We need to go to the Gospels to understand the interpretation of what God was trying to teach. Let's take a look at the last three declarations of Jesus on the cross. Matthew 27 verse 46 has the fifth declaration of Jesus Christ on the cross before his death. Matthew 27 verse 46, and listen carefully to what it says. 
It says, and about the ninth hour. Was it the ninth hour yet? No, it was about the ninth hour. Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that's the fifth declaration on the cross. Now let's go to number six, John 19 and verse 30. John 19 and verse 30. It says there, So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is what? It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. But you know, Matthew and John don't give the whole story because there was a declaration that was given before this one. It's just not recorded in the Gospel of John. You say, what declaration is that? Go with me to Luke 23, verse 46. This was the last declaration of Jesus on the cross after he said, it is finished. Notice Luke 23 and verse 46. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he what? He breathed his last. So when Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It was about the ninth hour. Probably shortly after that, he said, It is finished. And then exactly at the ninth hour, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And you say, how do you know that it was exactly at the ninth hour? Do you know what time the ninth hour is? It's three o'clock in the afternoon. See, so you say, well, well, you know, the ninth hour, that's three o'clock. How can it be three o'clock? Well, because the Jews, they reckoned uh, uh, hour number one at six o'clock in the morning. And hour number 12 was at sunset. And so hour number nine was at three o'clock in the afternoon. I want you to notice Exodus chapter 12 and verse 6. I'm going to show you when Jesus died exactly and specifically. Exodus 12 and verse 6. It's speaking about the death of the Passover lamb. You remember we talked about the death of the Passover lamb? When was it supposed to be sacrificed? On the 14th day of Nisan, right? The month of Nisan, first month of the religious year of the Jews. And at what time was it sacrificed? It was sacrificed... Notice Exodus chapter 12 and verse 6, it gives us the hour. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. That's the month of Nisan. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it, when? At twilight. Now that's not a good translation. Other versions say at evening. But literally in the Hebrew language in which this verse was written, it says between the two evenings. In other words, it doesn't say twilight, it doesn't say evening, it says literally between the two evenings. And you say, what is this between the two evenings thing? Well, let me explain it. Among the Jews, the first evening was when the sun reached its zenith and began its descent in the afternoon hours. The second evening is actually when the sun set. Are you understanding me? I'm going to read you a statement from a commentary. I looked at several commentaries. They all agree on this. So when the sun reached its zenith at noon, that was the first evening because the sun now was beginning the afternoon hours. It was beginning its descent. The second evening was when the sun set. Incidentally, in Spanish, we, we say uh, las horas de la mañana y las horas de la tarde, the afternoon. And so, and so we need to understand that the two evenings are noon and six o'clock. Let me read you from the commentary by Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown. This is not a Seventh-day Adventist commentary on Exodus uh, 12, verse 6. Between the two evenings is a phrase denoting the part of the day between the declining and the setting sun, or between noon and sunset. So what time did Jesus die? He died at the ninth hour, which is exactly between when? The sixth hour, which would be noon, and the twelfth hour, which would be sunset. 
Jesus died at the ninth hour exactly at three o'clock in the afternoon. Are you following me or not? Very, very important. In other words, Jesus said, into your hands I commend my spirit. And it was exactly at three o'clock. And at that moment, the temple, a veil rent in two. There was an earthquake and the lamb escaped from the hands of the priest. Now let me ask you, when Jesus said, it is finished, into your hands I commend my spirit, had he made perfect provision for salvation? Did he have a perfect life to offer to everyone who comes to him in repentance to take place of your sinful life? Absolutely. Had he died the death that everyone should die, that if I come to him in faith and in repentance and I confess my sin, he'll take his death and place it to my account as if it was my death. Absolutely. Jesus, when he said, it is finished, into your hands I commend my spirit, he had made perfect provision for salvation. Now Jesus died at three o'clock in the afternoon, but listen up. After the death of the lamb, the lamb had to be prepared. Because after sunset, the Jews partook of the feast of unleavened bread. So for three hours in the afternoon, from three o'clock until sunset, what they did was they roasted the lamb whole. They cleaned it up and they prepared it and they roasted it. And then after sundown, they ate the lamb along with unleavened bread and also with bitter herbs. Now let me ask you, when Jesus died at three o'clock in the afternoon, was it necessary to prepare the body of Jesus? Just look at everything that had to happen between three and shortly before sundown. They had to ask Joseph, they had to ask Pilate for the body of Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea. They had to take him down from the cross. They had to clean his body. They had to embalm him and wrap, wrap him in linen. They had to transport him to the place where he was going to be buried. They had to bury him. And they had to roll the stone in front of the tomb. Would that take five minutes to do all of that? Of course not. Actually, this is the preparation of Jesus to be buried. The unleavened bread represents the body of Jesus because leaven represents sin, and in Jesus there was no sin. Now let's take a look at the sequence of days so that we can understand a little bit better what is happening here. Was Jesus buried before sundown on Friday. Yes, you remember that they felt an urgency. They said, we have to hurry. We've got to get him off of the cross because he has to be buried before sundown. And so Jesus, right before sundown, he was placed in the tomb. Now let's look at the biblical sequence of days. Go with me to Luke chapter 23 and verse 54, and we'll read through verse 56. Luke 23 verses 54 through 56. I want you to see the sequence. It's speaking about the day of his death, first of all. That day was the preparation. And the Sabbath drew near. Was the Sabbath there yet? No. The Sabbath was what? Was near when Jesus died. Verse 55. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after. And they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. So his body is laid in the tomb. What day? Friday, which is uh, which day of the week? Day number six. Very well. And then notice verse 56. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Which commandment? The fourth commandment of God's holy law. They rested the Sabbath according to to the commandment. Now let me ask you this. How do you think the rest of the woman of the women was? Was it a joyful rest? Was it a happy and, and, and just bubbling rest? Absolutely not. It was not really rest. It was restlessness. They were filled with grief and with sorrow. That Sabbath must have been a miserable, miserable Sabbath to them. If they had understood what the manna represented, would, have been, would it have been very, very different? They would have said, our master is resting in the tomb from his works of redemption. And we need to rest 
with him in what he has done. And tomorrow he's going to resurrect. What would that Sabbath have been like if they had believed what Jesus said that he was going to go to Jerusalem and he was going to be killed and he was going to resurrect the third day? What would that Sabbath have been like? They would have understood that Jesus was resting in the tomb from his works of redemption like he rested on the seventh day from his works of creation. And they would have said, our master has accomplished salvation for us. How wonderful he is. They would have enjoyed the Sabbath of rest, but they did not understand. They came to understand later. Allow me to read you a statement from Ellen White. This is uh, found in... Uh, an article that she wrote titled The Man of Sorrows, February 24, 1898. Listen how she connects creation and redemption. She says, The Father and the Son rested after their work of creation. And then she quotes scripture. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended His work which He had made, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested. And then she comments, The death of Christ was designed to be at the very time in which it took place. It was in God's plan that the work which Christ had engaged to do should be completed on a Friday. What was God's plan? That the work of Christ should be what? Completed on a Friday. And now listen carefully. And that on the Sabbath he should rest in the tomb even as the Father and the Son had rested after completing their creative work. The hour of Christ's apparent defeat was the hour of his victory. The great plan devised before the foundations of the earth were laid was successfully carried out. So what was Jesus doing while the women rested? Jesus was also what? Resting. On which day of the week? The seventh day. Which day did Jesus rest after he accomplished his work of creation? The seventh day. You see, Jesus is the creator according to the Bible. John 1 and verse 3 says, All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus is the creator of Genesis. And after he finished his work of creation, he rested. And after he finished his work of redemption, he rested on the seventh day Sabbath. And then which day did Jesus resurrect? The Bible says he resurrected on the first day of the week, which would be our Sunday. Do you have the sequence of days clear? He died what day? Day number six, Friday. He rested in the tomb which day? On the Sabbath, he rested in the tomb and he resurrected which day? He resurrected on the first day of the week on Sunday. Now you say, where did we leave the manna? <laughs> well, let's go back to the manna episode because we want to see what great lesson God wanted to teach through the manna. Now let's review. What did the manna represent? The Word of God. What does the Word of God, what is the Word of God? Jesus. But what specific aspect of Jesus did the manna represent? His flesh. Let's read it again. John 6 and verse 51. John 6, 51. Here Jesus says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Now as Jesus rested in the tomb, he was the living manna, right? The manna represented his what? His flesh. The flesh of Jesus rests in the tomb. Now here's my question. What would have happened with a normal body that was buried on Friday? It would begin the process of what? Of decomposing. And eventually it would breed worms and it would what? And it would stink. Did that happen with the body of Jesus? What is it that happened with the manna that was picked up on Friday for Sabbath? It was just as fresh on Sabbath as it had been on Friday. And the manna represents the flesh of Jesus. Was the flesh of Jesus all day Sabbath as fresh as when he was placed in the tomb on Friday? I'm going to prove it from the Bible. God is teaching here the observance of the Sabbath in honor of redemption. Notice what we find in Acts chapter 2 and verses 25 through 27. 
Acts chapter 2 and verse, actually let's go first of all to the Messianic prophecy and then we'll go to Acts 2. The prophecy that, it, that is found in Acts 2 is in Psalm 16 verses 8 through 10. I want to read the, the prophecy first. It says here in Psalm 16 and verses 8 through 10, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, hand, I will not be shaken. And I'm reading from the NIV because it's a better translation. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Here Jesus is speaking prophetically a thousand years before he is actually born. He's telling his experience what is going to happen. Now notice what he says. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body, actually that is not a good translation. There's a word for body in Greek. It's the word soma. This is the same word flesh that is used in John 6 and verse 51. It's the word socks. The NIV mistranslates that word. So really it is, therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My flesh also will rest secure. What does Jesus say about his flesh? His flesh will what? His flesh will rest secure. Where is it going to rest? In the tomb. You say, how do we know that? Well, let's read the next verse. Because you will not abandon me to what? To the grave. Nor will you let your Holy One see what? See decay. To whom did Psalm 16 point? It pointed to the flesh of Jesus Christ. Did the body of Jesus Christ decompose in the grave? It did not, because Jesus was the living manna. Are you following me? Now, let's go to Acts chapter 2, verses 29 to 33. And once again, I'm reading in the NIV. Here Peter is preaching on the day of Pentecost. And he's going to explain Psalm 16, verses 8 through 10. Because you might say, well, who... How do you know that Psalm 16 is talking about Jesus? Well, Peter says so, inspired by God's Holy Spirit. Notice Acts 2, and let's begin reading at verse 29, and we'll go through verse 33. Peter says here, Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. In other words, this psalm was not talking about David because his tomb is here and he's dead. Notice verse 30. But he was a prophet. David was a prophet. And knew that God had promised on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of what? Of the resurrection of the Christ. That he was not abandoned to the grave nor did his body, once again it should be the word flesh, nor did his flesh see what? Decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. Isn't this a magnificent Bible prophecy? It was prophesying that Jesus, the manna, would die on Friday, on Sabbath he would remain in the tomb all day, and his body like the manna would not begin the process of breeding worms and stinking, because he was what the manna represented. In other words, this is not only telling us that we keep the Sabbath, it's telling us that Jesus kept the Sabbath by resting in the tomb on the Sabbath, and those who were outside also should have been resting, understanding fully what Jesus was doing. He should have been resting inside while they rested outside, understanding what Jesus had accomplished. Now we need to ask the question, why did Jesus resurrect on Sunday? <laughs> you know, uh, Christians today, they say Jesus resurrected on Sunday because he wanted Christians to know that Sunday is holy. And that we're supposed to, we're supposed to go to church on Sunday. And we're supposed to honor Jesus by celebrating the day of the resurrection. You know, even Pope John Paul II, in his pastoral letter, Dies Domini, 
uh, he, tried to, he tried to impress people by the number of things that Jesus did on Sunday. Let me give you a list of them. He resurrected on Sunday. He appeared to two of his followers on the road to Emmaus on Sunday. He appeared to his, his, his disciples on Sunday night. He appeared to them again the next Sunday. The Holy Spirit was poured out on Sunday. The first proclamation of the gospel took place on Sunday. The first baptisms took place on Sunday. So he gives this long list and he says, See, it's because God wants us now to keep Sunday. But in the light that what we've studied, we now notice that Jesus resurrected on Sunday, not because Sunday is important, but, before the, but because the day before Sunday is important. You see, Jesus had to rest in the tomb, which day? The Sabbath. So which day would he resurrect? Duh. Sorry for the expression. But if, I, if he has to fulfill the manna episode, and he has to rest in the tomb on the Sabbath day, according to the commandment, well, which day, which day would you expect him to resurrect? On Sunday. But it's not because Sunday is holy, but because Sabbath is holy. Are you with me? And isn't it interesting that during Holy Week, oh, Christians, they love to talk about Palm Sunday and Ash Wednesday, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Resurrection Sunday. Who says anything about the Sabbath? Nothing. Because the devil has made it his utmost objective to obliterate the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath points to Jesus as our Creator and as our Redeemer. And when we rest on the Sabbath, we're resting because He made us, and we're resting because He redeemed us from sin. You know, Christians sometimes present objectionable arguments. They use psychological arguments. They say, you know, I keep Sunday because Sunday was a happy day. See, the disciples were sad on Sabbath, but they were happy on Sunday. And Christians who don't study their, Bi their Bibles, they swallow it hook, line, sinker, fisherman's pole, fisherman and boat. <laughs> they swallow everything and they believe it because they don't study the Bible for themselves. Let me ask you, should Sabbath have been a sad day? Had Jesus warned the disciples that he was going to go to Jerusalem, he was going to die, and he was going to resurrect on the third day? Of course. Was it the intention of Jesus that the Sabbath be a joyful day of expectation? Absolutely. Furthermore, and this is even more devastating, Sunday night, the day of the resurrection, the disciples didn't even believe that Jesus had resurrected. You can see that in the Gospels. So how could they be happy all day Sunday if they didn't even believe he had resurrected? You see, the argument falls on its face. But people who don't study their Bibles and listen to what their preachers say, they say, oh, this sounds wonderful. We're supposed to keep Sunday because Jesus said we're supposed to keep Sunday. But it is not so. Now do you know that Sabbath not only points backwards to creation, it not only points to Jesus, our Redeemer now, but the Sabbath also has a prophetic dimension. The Sabbath will be kept in the earth made new. In the future, when God creates again new heavens and new earth. Go with me to Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23. Isaiah 66, 22 and 23. Here it makes it very clear that in the kingdom come, on the new earth, we will keep God's holy Sabbath in commemoration of the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. It says here, for as the new heavens, notice this, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, now you don't be confused by that new moon thing. The new moon was marked the beginning of the month. It's the word that is translated month. In the Old Testament. So in Spanish, for example, it says de mes en mes, because the new moon marked the beginning of the month. And so really, what it's saying is, and it shall come to pass that from month to month, and from one Sunday to another, oh, thank you, you're still with me, and from one what? One Sabbath to another, all the Jews shall come. No. Do you have flesh? <laughs> You're not ghosts. It says all flesh 
shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. What day will be kept in honor of the creation of the new heavens and the new earth? God's holy Sabbath. Now you say, why are we going to go from month to month? We know from Sabbath to Sabbath because that's God's rest day to commemorate the new creation. But why from month to month? Revelation 22 verses 1 and 2 has the answer. Revelation 22 and verses 1 and 2. It says here, here John is speaking about what he saw in vision, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, actually a better translation is the square, in the middle of its street. You know, people when they say, I'm going to walk the streets of gold. No, you're not. It doesn't say in the Bible streets of gold. It says street, which in the light of what we studied on the 70 weeks is really the town square. So anyway, it says in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life. Notice one tree. You say, how, how is that? On either side of the river and it's one tree? Ellen White explains it beautifully. She says that there's one trunk on one side and one trunk on the other, and they meet in the middle over the river. So there's no contradiction. And so it says, was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits. Now listen carefully. Each yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. How frequently does the tree of life produce its fruit? Every month. Which means that we are going to go to partake of the tree of life every what? Every month. You read the messages to the churches. God says that he's going to give us to eat from the tree of life. So we're going to go to eat. But it produces its fruit every month. And so now we know why we're going to go monthly. And we're also going to go what? We are also going to go weekly to commemorate the creation of the new heavens and of the new earth. But somebody says, Pastor, are you sure that we're going to go and worship before the Lord on Sabbath? Isn't it true that there's not going to be any sun or moon? So if there's no sun or moon, how, how, can there be, uh, how can there be days? How can there be months? Well, the problem is people don't read the Bible carefully. Let's go to that text. Revelation 21, verse 23. Revelation 21 and verse 23. See, we got to read carefully. The Bible doesn't say that there's not going to be any sun or moon. Listen to what it says. The city, not the new earth, the city had no need of the sun or of the moon. Does it say that there's not going to be any sun or moon? No, it says that it had no, the city had no need of sun or moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it, and the Lamb is its light. Let me give you an illustration so you can understand. Supposing that at midday in July in Fresno, I'm walking down the street, and I have a flashlight in my hand, and the flashlight is on, and I'm shining the flashlight on the ground. Is the light shining? Of course it's shining. Somebody comes up to me and says, are you crazy? <laughs> so what do you mean crazy? This flashlight has light, right? It says, worry, I don't see it. Because you can't see it on the ground. Why? Because the glory of the sun is so bright that it is as if the flashlight sheds no light. In other words, the glory of God is going to be so bright that the sun and the moon will be eclipsed. Read Isaiah 24, verse 23, where it says that the, that the sun and the moon are going to be ashamed before the glory of God. Now allow me to mention one thing in closing. In the most holy place of the sanctuary, God put the Ark of the Covenant. And the Sabbath commandment was highlighted in the Ark of the Covenant. You know, Ellen White had a vision where she saw the law of God in heaven, and she says that there was a halo of light that shone around the Sabbath commandment. And some have to say, well, where did she get that from? Where is that in the Bible? I'll tell you where it is. The Sabbath is highlighted. What was inside the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments. Is the Sabbath in the Ten Commandments? It most certainly is. It's the Fourth Commandment. But did God give something additional that he put inside the Ark of the Covenant to highlight the Sabbath and to underline that it is a test and it is extremely important? 
Yes, what did he place there? The manna highlights and underlines the Sabbath. And God is saying, if you don't get it from the Ten Commandments, get it from the manna. Let's read Deuteronomy 10, verses 1 and 2, and verse 5 in closing. It says, At that time the Lord said to me, Hew for yourself, he's speaking to Moses, two tablets of stone like the first, and come up to me on the mountain and make yourself an ark of wood. And I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke, and you shall put them where? In the ark. Then I turned and came down from the mountain and put the tablets in the ark which I had made, and there they are, just as the Lord commanded me. Now listen to what I'm going to say. We're going to talk in our next lecture about what happened in 1844. There was a great disappointment in 1844. When Jesus entered the most holy place, people were oblivious to what Jesus really was going to do. They didn't understand it. Just like it happened in the triumphal entry, the people did not understand it. Later on, they studied scripture and they understood that the date was correct, but the event that was going to take place on that date was incorrect. After the great disappointment, the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church went back to the Bible and they started studying Scripture and they discovered that Jesus had entered the most holy place of the sanctuary. And you know, one after another, they started discovering the distinctive truths of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. They discovered that the law is in the heavenly sanctuary, which means that the law is still binding. And they said, but if in heaven there's the Ten Commandments, there's also the Fourth Commandment among the Ten. So the Sabbath is binding. They looked at Aaron's rod, which budded by a miracle of God. Life from that which was dead, they said, life is only in Christ, not in some immortal soul. They discovered the idea of the judgment. The distinctive truths of the Seventh-day Adventist Church were discovered when they entered the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary.